Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shazia Ali, and I am extremely honored to be able to present this very important topic, which I think is typically um, overlooked due to just how few specialists are able to treat this type of disease. Um, today, I'll be speaking about pediatric corneal opacities with special emphasis on corneal transplant surgery. I'm truly honored to be able to speak to such an international audience, and I do realize that many people have a very uh, different background coming to this talk today. So I'm going to go over the basics today, and we can um, delve more into details as we move forward. I did receive a number of questions, which I hope to have addressed during the talk today. But at the end, there will be a question and answer session in case there are any remaining uh, burning questions on your mind. I'll also leave my contact information at the end. That way, you can contact me directly. So looking at pediatric corneal transplants, there's a lot we need to cover today. Corneal disease accounts for over 10% of worldwide blindness. So today we will be looking at preoperative considerations, which patients we should be taking to the operative room, which types of surgeries are good for pediatric patients, intraoperative considerations, postoperative considerations, as well as long-term prognosis and how to really improve the outcomes of our pediatric patients. Now points to consider. Pediatric patients and pediatric surgery is not the same as adult surgery, so it is really important to make sure that you are prepared as well as preparing the family for what they're going to need. Not every corneal opacity requires a corneal transplant surgery, and we'll talk about other intraocular options uh, during the course of the talk today. Now, a clear graft, it does not always equal clear vision. Um, unfortunately, unlike adult patients who tend to have excellent outcomes after corneal transplant surgery, pediatric patients are so dependent on amblyopia and the development of their ocular dominance columns that they may not even have clear or good vision after an excellent clear graft surgery. It is extremely, extremely important to maintain an excellent and lifelong relationship with the patient as family because you will be taking care of these patients for many years. Now we should be screening for any sort of social circumstances, whether the patient lives really far away, whether they're able to afford or not afford any of their post-operative drops, and that could pro preclude proper post-operative care, and that may want us and lead us to doing surgeries that may not be transplant surgeries, but other options in order to get the best outcome for these patients. Postoperatively, we absolutely need to have a plan in place with a pediatric ophthalmologist in order to perform amblyopia treatment as well as low vision treatment. Um, I am currently a pediatric trained as well as a corneal specialist trained um, ophthalmologist in the U.S., so therefore I feel like I do have the unique ability to be able to manage not only their corneal disease, but as well as their amblyopia treatment. Um, what is success? Now, success for pediatric patients is very different from success for adult patients. What we are looking at is developmental vision. It's more important than corneal clarity. Some of these patients will come in with very dense opacities and they're able to function much more than you're able than, than you would have expected for them. What we're looking for is their global milestone development within a normal range. Are they able to walk on their own? Do they have ambulatory vision? Are, are they able to see colors, contrasts? Those types of things are more important than a number on the Snellen chart. Now, central visual acuity is one component of visual function, but children are really able to adapt well using peripheral cues. They can use contrast sensitivity and their spatio-temporal relationships develop until about age eight. So we do need to make sure that we set expectations for our family for surgical success. These patients and parents may be looking online, looking at outcomes for adult corneal transplant surgery and expecting certain outcomes, it's really important to sit down and have a long discussion with them that their pediatric corneal transplant, their kids are going to have a different outcome and will require lifelong treatment and therapy in order to have maybe even a modest or very even low improvement in visual quality. But given that they are developing normally, they can have a quote unquote normal lifestyle. Now, when we look at preoperative considerations, what should we be thinking about when we are dealing with these patients? What we need to really determine is the diagnosis. And that is one of the most important parts for pediatric corneal transplant. 
Every scar, every opacity is not the same. This is the commonly taught, really old school method of learning congenital corneal opacity is this mnemonic known as stumped. Um, but this doesn't really look at the etiology or the cause for why this patient was born with a corneal opacity. Um, old terms like sclerocornea, Peter's anomaly, um, are really not even used anymore. What we need to be actually looking at is the etiology of where this corneal opacity is coming from. Now, I stole this slide from uh, Ken Nischel in, in Pittsburgh, one of his videos that I was listening to recently. I hope that's okay with him. But I think it does a really good job of looking at um, pediatric corneal opacities and dividing it into a developmental anomaly of the cornea versus an acquired corneal disease. If you look at the column on the left, all of the diseases that are highlighted in green are really amenable to having a corneal transplant surgery. And we'll talk about the types of surgery. So these are the corneal dystrophies, CHED, PPMD, um, CHSD, X-linked endothelial um, dystrophies, as well as corneal structural defects due to dermoids, either isolated or part of golden Har syndrome. Um, if there's a uh, CIPI B1 patho cytopathology, so looking at things like um, congenital glaucoma, as well as developmental anomalies of the anterior segment. So the term Peters anomaly that people have been talking about for many years has now been re-termed to keratoiridolenticular dysgenesis, or KILD. So basically, there is an abnormal separation between the anterior strike segment structures. If there are iridocorneal adhesions only between the iris and the cornea, these patients tend to do very well with the corneal transplant surgery. Whereas if the lens fails to separate from the cornea, or it fails to separate but fails to form, or it fails to form at all, like a primary aphakia, patients in red on that left column tend to do very poorly with any type of corneal transplant surgery. So really determining what the etiology of the corneal opacity is will depend and give you an idea of what the prognosis will be. Looking at the other side, if there is acquired corneal disease, these patients tend to do typically a little bit better. And that's really because their vision may have developed normally within the first few years of life. These are patients that present to you in their you know, five, eight, 10 teens, um, after trauma, after infection, and that can really tell you what type of uh, vision you are expecting, which can typically be much better, especially in patients with keratoconus or keratoglobus. Now, in order to really determine what the pathology is, and where the diagnosis needs to come from, we need to do two types of um, biomicroscopy. The first step is always getting a patient history. When did the opacity start? How has the vision been developing? Were there any um, congenital or issues during delivery, during the prenatal period? Once the patient is born, even in the neonatal period, we can do things like high-frequency ultrasound or UBM, which is shown on the top. This is a similar machine to what you may be familiar with using a B-scan, but it does use a high-frequency probe. And that allows you to really focus on the structure of the anterior segment to a high detail. You can see in the top screen, if you look at those top two images, you might say, this is the central corneal opacity, what could be the cause? But if you're able to get a UBM, and you can usually use a B-scan, a normal B-scan that's used in the operating room. Now, the quality may not be as good as a UBM probe, but you're able to really determine if there are iridocorneal opacities or if the lens is involved. And we know, as we've discussed, that if the lens is involved, that does um, pretend a much poorer prognosis. A higher uh, um, in-depth imaging that we could consider is an anterior segment OCT. Now, this is a little bit harder to come across. Um, it's a little bit more expensive and not as readily available, but it does give you a better quality uh, cut through the cornea so you can really localize the pathology and determine if it's full thickness, partial thickness, or how deep the uh, corneal opacity does extend into the eye. And that can tell you what type of corneal transplant you may need for these patients. Looking at one of my patients that I recently took to the operating room, um, this is a baby that was born with bilateral corneal opacities, uh, and we took him to the operating room for a UBM. Now his right eye looked like this image in the top left. You can see there are significant iridocorneal opacities, mostly peripherally. 
um, which does show that if we wanted to do a transplant on this eye, we would be okay. Whereas in the other eye, there is much more significant irritable corneal touch, which may portend a worse prognosis. Um, and if there was any lens involvement, that would also decrease the chance of having surgical success for a corneal transplant surgery. One uh, excellent review article that I have run across recently was published um, in India with the group listed below. Now, most of uh, what I will be going over for the rest of the talk really can be found in this um uh, in this publication, it does go through all of the etiologies of pediatric corneal disease and keratoplasty. So I really do want to um, kind of share this as a resource for anyone that is interested in getting an excellent background review on pediatric corneal diseases, as well as pediatric surgery. And we'll go over some of these moving forward. Now, as I mentioned before, kids are not just little adults. Um, they have different developmental needs. They have different outcomes with their corneal transplant surgery. So it's extremely important to not treat the parents, the family, the patients, the surgery, or the postoperative outcome as though you are treating a young adult. Now, the age of the patient does present an increased risk with corneal transplant surgery. We'll go over what ages we can do types of surgery with, as well as the risk of amblyopia. If these kids are born with a central corneal opacity, they are going to have a much denser amblyopia than if this corneal opacity developed later in life, where they have already moved past the amblyogenic phase of their vision development. The timing of surgery is also extremely important for kids. Um, if you do kid, if you do surgery at a younger age, there will be certain risks associated with that as opposed to waiting. There will also be different risks associated with that, which we will shortly discuss. The indications for surgery are also extremely different. In adults, we're doing penetrating keratoplasty, DSEC, DMEC for things like Fuchs dystrophy, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, um, mostly keratoconus, corneal lacerations, scars from infections, whereas in kids, we're looking at congenital diseases. So the indications are quite different, and that does make the outcomes very different. These patients need an, an extremely close post-operative monitoring, and that's why you need to have an excellent relationship with the family because the eye drops as well as any anti-inflammatory regimen that these kids will be placed on will have an in increasingly important impact on their post-operative outcome. There is an extremely high risk of complications with this type of surgery, and it is extremely important for the, for the patient to have a strong social support network in order to ensure success and, uh, and proper vision development. Now, if we look at the indications and alternatives to surgery, it really depends on the characteristics of the pathology when this corneal opacity popped up. Is it in one eye? Is it in both eyes? Or are there any alternatives? Should we be doing anything other than surgery for these kids? So if we look at these three images, you can see um, a photo of a uh, infrotemporal corneal dermoid, as well as two central corneal opacities. So as you can see, the visual axis is going to be completely obscured with some of these, and the denser the opacity, the more dense the amblyopia, whereas the patient with the infrotemporal dermoid may only have um, irregular astigmatism, which is causing a refractive amblyopia. So the characteristics that we should be looking at is, is this central opacity, I'm sorry, is this corneal opacity peripheral versus central? And that can really tell you as to the timing as well as the type of surgery that the patient may need. Is it localized? Is it only in the inf infrotemporal quadrant or is it diffusely over the entire cornea? Is this a mild opacity that can be treated with things like glasses or is it a dense opacity that needs surgery? And then finally, is this an isolated corneal issue or are there systemic issues that we need to be concerned about? Patients with systemic disease tend to have a worse prognosis as well as higher risk of anesthesia complications. If we look at the age of onset, um, as we've talked about, neonatal corneal opacities tend to be congenital in nature and have some type of genetic association. The juvenile onset patients will do a little bit better because they've passed that amblyogenic age range. If there's trauma, that can also um, affect what type of surgery and when to do it. And then later on in life, these pediatric patients can develop keratoconus, and that does uh, typically have a different set of 
associated surgeries that we could consider. Now, unilateral versus bilateral is extremely contentious. There is no consensus. I know some corneal specialists that, that will not operate on a unilateral corneal opacity. If the fellow eye is normal with normal vision, they do not want to risk having any type of um, complications associated. Whereas I think it does depend on the status of the fellow eye. Some corneal specialists, as well as pediatric specialists, do want to do surgery on a unilateral eye because it does improve a chance of binocular vision through development of stereo. Now, it is extremely important to realize that even if you did corneal surgery on the second eye, the chance of the vision in that second eye being as good as the first eye is very, very low. So in that case, it could be considered to be a quote unquote spare eye because the vision in one eye is still significantly worse, the patient's typically considered monocular and functionally and can, and can be considered functionally blind. That does increase the chance of them having trauma in that second eye, and that does um, potentially open the risk of having vision loss in the good eye. Even with bilateral corneal opacities, there is no consensus as to what to do for these patients. Should we operate on the better potential eye? Should we operate on both eyes? Should we operate on the worst potential eye? A lot of corneal specialists will want to initially operate on the worst potential eye. That way you are saving the better potential eye from any type of untoward complications that may pop up. Now in the future, if the initially worse eye that's had the corneal transplant becomes the better eye with amblyopia treatment and therapy, then you could consider operating on the initially better eye in order to improve their binocularity. Um, typically for surgery, the outcomes tend to be better after two to four months of age. So when these kids are born with corneal opacities, we do tend to want to wait until about six to eight weeks before doing any type of surgery for bilateral patients. Now the alternatives are always no surgery. We can treat amblyopia progression through things like uh, occlusion therapy, atropine penalization, as well as treating any type of strabismic or refractive amblyopia that has developed. We always love to have patients in glasses, regardless of whether they have surgery or not. Um, scleral contact lenses, rigid contact lenses are very good for the irregular astigmatism that typically happens with these corneal opacities. And we can also uh, delve into a septoral um, iridectomy, also known as an optical iridectomy, which we typically prefer not to have it in the superior or the temporal quadrant. The types of surgery um, depends on the optimal timing. Now, as we discussed, the early visual rehabilitation, it must be weighed against the increased risk of surgical complications in children. Um, even though these kids may have dense corneal haze and a really poor red reflex, sometimes you'll be really surprised at how well these patients are able to see. They may not be able to read on the Snellen chart, but they may be able to function very well independently walking through their home. I had a patient with a complete corneal opacity that was able to, um, to identify colors in which we were extremely shocked at. He was an, an, an extraordinarily intelligent patient. So it's things to think about, um, should we be doing surgeries in these patients despite all the surgical complications that can develop? Things that I always look at are fixation, one eye or both eyes. How are the eyes aligned? Is there a sex sensory exotropia, sensory esotropia? Is there any component of nystagmus? If all of these are quote unquote normal, I tend to wait on the surgery if I can. However, if the fixation is poor, if there is a significant strabismus, if there is a sensory nystagmus, those would be reasons to do surgery earlier rather than later. So looking at the timing for surgery, when we're looking at doing surgery early for patients, the real benefits of doing it is that we can have improved amblyopia management. And that is because we are able to early, uh, um, to early, early intervene to have a rehabilitation of the clear visual axis. So these patients will be able to see through a clear cornea. However, when these patients are young, the risk of multiple anesthesia episodes is higher um, and the risk of neurological consequences from anesthesia also goes higher. However, um, younger kids can sometimes get the eye drops in easier if they are infants. Parents are able to successfully put them in without having to fight them, and that can be um, a, a real benefit of doing early surgery. When patients are older, we typically do want to do the surgery soon after any type of trauma and not really wait. And if there is an infant that has an initial PKP, which typically we like to do within the first two to three months of life, the second PKP we like to do within two to four weeks if possible. 
However, on the on the other end of the spectrum, if the first eye is doing well, some corneal specialists will want to delay that and do the second eye much later. Now, the benefits of doing late surgery would be there is typically an improved graft survival. Um, I typically tell parents that the highest risk of rejection as well as failure of grafts happens when kids are younger than five years of age. However, it is very dependent on the indication for surgery. Um, typically, there is an easier postoperative course because um, you're able to examine the patients with a portable or an actual slit lamp. Um, plus or minus easier adherence, some, adult pa some older patients will really fight you for the eye drops, especially in that toddler age. And it's really difficult to get the appropriate anti-inflammatory regimen in. So something to consider about the timing of surgery. It is very important though for congenital glaucoma. If you are going to do a corneal transplant, you need to achieve excellent IOP control in order to ensure that the endothelial cells are able to function well after the corneal transplant surgery has been completed. Now, what are the surgical options? As we talked about pediatric transplants, they don't always go well. So sometimes we do want to do something and sometimes we really just don't want to do anything. Looking at the thickness and uh, the layers of the cornea, we're all familiar with the epithelial layer, Bowman's layer, um, stromal, the decimase membrane, as well as the endothelium. And there are a multiple different um, corneal transplant options that we could consider for our patients. The first is a penetrating keratoplasty, as you can see here, red to red. You do a full thickness graft and put in um, at least 16 up to um, 24 plus sutures in order to close this corneal, uh, uh, corneal lesion. Uh, the dulk graft is a deep anterior lamello keratoplasty. So as you see here, in the image, you are removing the entire epithelial Bowman's layer as well as a stroma, typically down to decimase as, as close as you can get to decimase membrane. The DSEC graft is an endothelial keratoplasty where you are using a little bit of stroma to bolster the thickness of this tissue, which is typically about 40 to 60 microns of tissue. And it also includes a decimase membrane as well as the epithelium, I'm sorry, endothelium. And finally, the DMET graft, which is technically very challenging, especially in pediatric patients. This is a four to 10 micron thick layer of tissue that only includes the decimase membrane as well as the endothelium, and there's no stroma um, associated with this. If we look at um, alternatives to tr corneal transplant surgery, one of the common options is an optical iridectomy. So this option will allow you to create a peripheral hole in the cornea, and I'll go over the pros and cons in just a bit, uh, just a bit but you can see here how we pull out part of the iris and create an opening. So the central corneal opacity in figure A is able to be bypassed without requiring a full thickness or even a partial thickness corneal transplant. Now, the benefits for this is that the peripheral light rays that will enter through this peripheral area through the iris can develop central visual acuity up to 2040. You'll be really impressed by how well these kids are able to see with a peripheral opening um, in their visual access. There will be a significant improvement with ambulatory vision. These kids that are not able to see much more um, than light in that eye may actually be able to have useful vision develop. And you can also um, use this as a temporizing measure in order to give yourself some time before you need to do a corneal transplant in these patients. We tend to avoid the, the superior half of the cornea or, or anterior segment, and that's really because the eyelid will cover any type of optical opening. The same goes with the temporal cornea. Um, it can be a little bit difficult if there is eyelid covering that as well. So typically the inferior and the nasal quadrants are what we like to do this type of surgery on. There are two ways to do this type of surgery. One is using a vitrector. So it's a vitrector assisted optical iridectomy. Um, you would want to go in peripherally and you can really customize how large or how small you want this opening to be using a vitrector. Now this does have a higher risk of cataract formation because you are entering an eye that still has a natural lens in. So you should weigh the risks and, risks and benefits of doing this type of procedure. The alternative would be a forceps assisted, which is the image that I had just shown on the screen below, which is where you create a peripheral opening in the peripheral cornea and you will pull out the peripheral iris and create a large snip. Now you cannot control how large you can. Um, however, I think that it's a little bit less predictable as to the opening size. And since you are creating uh, more inflammation in the eye, there can be a large persistent hyphema, which is what we want to avoid in children. This incision also requires a suture. 
And if you want to close this with a tenovicrol, rule, you will develop a corneal opacity in the area of the clear cornea, which is a reason some patients, some, some practitioners choose to avoid this option. The cons of this is that patient will have eccentric viewing. They may have some glare photophobia. There may be an unacceptable cosmesis result. So this is a patient that you see um, over here on the, on the top right where a colleague of mine has created an inferonasal sectoral uh, optical iridectomy. And we'll move on and discuss this patient a little bit more in depth in just a few minutes. The other option, which is not as commonly used in the pediatric population, is the Boston keratoprosthesis. It comes with a front plate, a back plate, a corneal graft, and a locking ring. So if we look at our uh, animated cornea, it is a full thickness intervention, and it does come in two types. Type 1 is full thickness through the cornea, and type 2 does require a full tarsorophy, and the implant goes through the lid. Now, very, very few practitioners would recommend doing this type of surgery. Type 2 is not even indicated in any pediatric patient. Type 1, you could consider in pediatric patient, but there's such a high risk of glaucoma development, as well as retrocorneal membrane and endophthalmitis. It's very difficult to um, monitor the progression and health of, of the eyes in these patients. So really in bilaterally blind patients, I think very few patients, uh, surgeons would even recommend this. And most of the outcomes do lead to very poor surgical prognosis and visual prognosis. Now, looking at the indications for the different types of surgeries, if we look at penetrating keratoplasty, which is a full thickness corneal transplant, in developed nations, we are typically seeing this type of surgery for congenital developmental disorders, as well as acquired non-traumatic disorders. In developing nations, the sequelae of nutritional deficiency, typically vitamin A, is where we're seeing these type of surgeries, as well as post-traumatic scars. DALK, which is the anterior lamellar keratoplasty, we can see and use with superficial corneal scars, lumbal dermoid, post-herpetic scars, keloid, or even advanced keratoconus. An endothelial procedure like DSEC or DMEC, um, we could consider for patients that have CHED, PPMD, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, X-linked endothelial dystrophy, post-birth trauma, decimates break, boiled corneal transplants as well. And the last two that we had just discussed, the sectoral iridectomy as well as the Boston K-Pro, you can see are used for um, very small indications. Now, the first surgical technique that we'll talk about is the penetrating keratoplasty. As you can see here, it's a full thickness corneal surgery um, on our animated cornea over here. It does require general anesthesia. Now, there are risks associated with the retrobulbar block. Some people like to do this in addition. I would not recommend it due to high posterior pressure. And these kids already have a higher posterior pressure due to their dense vitreous, which is still consolidated at this age. You could consider using a Honan balloon as well as IV mannitol to lower the posterior pressure, but make sure you do give it as an infusion over 15 minutes and not as a bolus. We should be positioning these patients, Trendelenburg, in order to lower the posterior pressure. And we do typically tend to uh, do a trephination procedure, which is similar to the adults. Um, most surgeons will perform a peripheral iridotomy. These patients, due to a high risk of fibrin and inflammation in the anterior chamber, are likely to go into angle closure, and a peripheral iridotomy can help prevent the development of glaucoma from a secondary mechanism. We do like to do initially a very small graft. These kids are at a much higher risk of needing an additional corneal transplant. And if you're able to increase the size and the diameter of the trephination moving forward, a smaller graft initially will allow you to do that. So this is, again, a staged procedure where you're thinking about the long-term success of the eye health and not just one surgery. Typically, these patients will receive tenonylon sutures in, a, in an interrupted manner only. A running is ind contraindicated in very young children for a PKP. However, for keratoconus, you could consider a running suture technique. Now, looking at the intraoperative considerations, these patients tend to have very low scleral rigidity, especially the younger you are. If you're operating in the neonatal age range, the scleral rigidity is very, very thin. We always recommend fluoringa rings or a double fluoringa ring. Another option would be a McNeil Goldman scleral fixation ring. However, when you are suturing to the sclera to fixate with these rings, there is a scleral perforation risk, which is much higher than adults due to the due to the scleral thinness. So something to consider when you're trying to pass sutures for these kids. They have a very small intrapalpebral space. So you always want to use a smaller size donor tissue 
And you always want to consider the fact that these kids have a very narrow anterior chamber depth. When you're trephinating, it's very easy if you're going full thickness with your tree find to actually hit iris, which will cause a significant uh, hyphema and AC reaction. Now, this higher posterior pressure that we were talking about, it can cause the iris to prolapse forward during the surgery. And we'll talk about ways to combat that. The lens can also be extruded and in very, very unfortunate cases, you could have a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Over here on the right, you'll see some options of fluoringa ring. For these pediatric patients, especially neonatal corneal opacities, you need to choose the absolute smallest size fluoringa ring that is available. Or you could also consider the scleral fixation ring, the McNeil Goldman that you can see below. Now, for these PKP donor graphs, we typically want to use a very small sized graph, 5.5 to 7 millimeters. Um, some surgeons will oversize by 0.5. I tend to like to oversize by one millimeter to give myself some more space to operate. And in terms of the graft tissue that is available, we do like to age match these as much as possible. Um, some surgeons will limit their patients from four years to 19. I typically like to get the tissue as close to age to match the um, patient's age as possible. But the most important thing is that the endothelial cell count is greater than 3,000 cells per millimeter squared. And if you're in a bind and you do have older tissue, as long as the endo count is within that range, you could potentially consider it. If we look at the average cell density by age range, you can see how the endothelial cell count decreases as we get older, which is why it's extremely important to age match this tissue. If you are able to get a specular microscopy on the tissue before, you want to see things like the normal endothelium on the bottom left. Now, if there is a low density of endothelium, polymegathism, or gutte, you do not want to accept that tissue for your patient. There were um, some questions about corneal tissue harvesting. In the U.S., we're fortunate to have the iBank Association of America, which makes the process extremely easy for us. This is a website that you can go through. They're really um, integral in ensuring retrieval, storage, tissue evaluation, donor eligibility, assessment, processing, and distribution is done up to extremely high standards, so we're able to get the best tissue available. When I get the tissue from the iBank Association, it comes as three three sheets. This is what I look at, the donor age, the death to preservation time, as well as the storage media, why the patient died, what the expiration date is, as well as what the approved usages are for that tissue. On the second page, I think it's extremely important to look in the top left-hand corner. You'll see the endothelial cell density. Again, you want it above 3,000. You can also look um, at the slit lamp exam, what they found um, to be very uh, uh, important for the epithelium, the stroma, if there's any scars, um, how's the decimase membrane, and most importantly, how's the endothelium. They also tend to show an, a, a, a specular microscopy photograph for every, fo for every patient that's sent, and you can really assess the quality of the, of the endothelium before you implant this tissue in your patient. It's also extremely important to ensure that the serologies are all negative and to make sure that there is no infectious pathology that you are implanting into your own patient. Looking at the surgical techniques for a penetrating keratoplasty in a neonatal patient, um, this is an excellent uh, review article that uh, I found online that, over, that goes over the sandwich technique. Now, this is an extremely important technique for pediatric patients. Um, usually within the first few years of life, if I'm doing a corneal transplant, what you typically want to do is remove a quadrant of the, pa of the patient's host cornea and suture it back on itself as shown as figure A. Once you re completely remove the host cornea and sutured it back to itself, you can then place the donor cornea on top suture that as shown in 1C in, in, in a completely different quadrant um, at 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. And actually looking at figure 1D, you can slip out the host tissue. This really prevents iris prolapse, lens extrusion, and the difficulties of high posterior pressure for pediatric patients. So I do highly encourage everyone that's interested in pediatric keratoplasty to go over the sandwich technique. Now, this is a pediatric uh, patient who came to me when he was uh, a, a neonate. He was born in our hospital. He ended up having a bilateral corneal transplant um, within the first few months of his life. As you can see, even with a very successful corneal transplant, he still has a large sensory esotropia of that second eye, um, but he does have ambulatory vision and overall, I think, a, a very good surgical outcome. Moving on. Um, to another patient. Now, this is an older patient, a 10-year-old patient who presented to me after a cat scratch 
very severe infection um, to his left eye. He ended up having a full thickness corneal transplant very soon after. We tried multiple antibiotics, antifungals, um, antiprotozoa, nothing responded. Um, he ended up having a full thickness corneal transplant. In these kids, as well as adults, if you do a, a corneal transplant in a hot inflamed eye, it's most likely going to fail. So although his initial transplant looked great, he did require a second transplant, and now he's seeing um, 2070 without any correction, and we are looking to get him uh, hopefully into a contact lens sometime soon. Looking at um, other types of corneal transplant, if we think about a DSEC, which is an endothelial keratoplasty, if we look at our uh, corneal image on the top right, you can see that the inner lining of the cornea is removed and replaced. So doing things like um, CHED, PPMD, removing the inner lining of the cornea and replacing it with an endothelial transplant, you can have excellent outcomes and also decrease the risk of all the suture um, and wound-related astigmatism. So the pros are it does eliminate the risks of open sky procedures with the PKP. You can have rapid visual rehabilitation and, and early amblyopia treatment. You do decrease wound astigmatism, so you can have better refractive stability, very low astigmatism for these patients, and also decrease the suture-related complications. Now, it is very difficult to identify decimase membrane, especially if you don't have an intraoperative OCT. These patients do have a shallow AC, which makes it difficult to get in and out of the eye, as well as to get the tissue in the eye. These kids do not have much scleral rigidity. They do have a high posterior pressure and you can have a high risk of iris prolapse again. Some uh, surgeons do advocate the use of a sheet glide to get the tissue in and out of the eye. Now, post-operative positioning is very hard. If you're able to do this in a young patient that is not ambulatory, they may be able to do their post-operative care at home. Otherwise, you may need to admit them to the hospital in order to ensure uh, proper positioning for the first three to five days after surgery. The, another really difficult thing is that rebubbling does require anesthesia for these patients. So we do need to look at the risk of anesthesia and multiple anesthesia episodes for these patients. We should always use postoperative shields to prevent inadvertent trauma, which can lead to graft dislodging in the immediate postoperative period. The next um, procedure that we're gonna talk about is DMEC. Very low number of indications for patients in the pediatric population. And that's because there is no stromal tissue implanted as you can see in the corneal anime, animation to the top right. This is just a decimase membrane and endothelial keratoplasty. There is a very rapid visual recovery, less risk of rejection because there is no foreign stroma than the DSEC procedure, which we just covered. But it is a much more demanding surgical technique in both adults and pediatric pediatric patients. This does have a higher rate of endothelial cell loss, about 33 to 50% in comparison to, P to the uh, um, DSEC procedure. There's also a higher risk of rebubbling. And we just talked about how rebubbling does require multiple trips to the operating room. So something to consider um, if we did want to do this type of procedure in a pediatric population. The next procedure we're going to talk about is ALK, which is an anterior lamellar keratoplasty versus a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. As you can see here on the corneal animation, you're removing the anterior part of the corneal stroma as well as Bowman's membrane and the epithelium. There is a significantly lower risk of graft rejection and failure up to about 20%. It can be much higher when the endothelium is involved. There's a decreased risk of wound dehiscence, decreased postoperative astigmatism, but there are similar suture-related complications. However, sutures can be removed much earlier than a penetrating keratoplasty. There are good visual outcomes with amblyopia treatment. More than 80% of patients can have excellent vision. An intraoperative OCT can guide your surgical technique in order to get as far and close down to Desaimé's membrane as you can. Now, there is a high risk of conversion to PKP, and it can be as high as 50%, so it's important to have backup tissue available for you. Big bubble DALK, which is uh, proposed by Anwar and his team, it is preferred in the pediatric keratoconus population, and these patients can have better than 20-40 vision in about 50% of patients. If we look back at this patient that had the sectoral aerodectomy that I had discussed earlier, as you can see here, we have the anterior segment OCT, which can highlight the level of pathology in this eye. It's restricted to the anterior, less than 50% of the stroma, which does allow us with the um, 
ASOCT guided imaging to really know how deep to go with this surgery. So I was able to perform a successful AOK procedure for this patient, as you can see in the top right. And he's had an excellent postoperative outcome. As you can see here, you're able to really see into the eye. We were able to see the lens, able to see that the retina was normal and his vision initially improved because of his peripheral iridectomy. And now with amblyopia treatment, we're really hoping that he'll have excellent vision. Um, initially, his surgery was done around five years of age. This was just performed a few months ago, and we're looking forward to how much his vision can improve as he gets older. This is another patient with an ALK procedure. Um, this patient has an infrotemporal dermoid. As you can see here, it does completely obscure the visual access and extends through um, to the superior and the nasal cornea. He had an anterior lamellar keratoplasty procedure done here, which is why he has interrupted and in running sutures, which I can perform. Um, and he has an excellent postoperative result. Now, unfortunately, this eye has such high cylinder compared to the other eye. Um, he's only able to tolerate glasses at this young age, but I'm hoping that once we're able to get him into contact lenses, we can get him to have really excellent vision, but you can really compare the pre-op to the post-op and, and see how much clearer the visual access is. Now, not all dermoids or anterior um, corneal opacities require a lamellar keratoplasty. You can just do a superficial keratectomy for very superficial dermoids. So the top two images shows a pre-op and post-op um, dermoid that I removed with amniotic membrane, and the patient is healed very nicely. As you can see here on the bottom, there can be some residual corneal scarring, but this is easily treated with a glasses prescription. Um, another option that we could consider in some patients is an ipsilateral rotational autokeratoplasty, where we typically are looking at patients that are not candidates for PKP. Their corneal opacity has to be less than four millimeters in the central cornea, and they have to have a, a peripheral clear cornea. You want to do a trephination size of eight to nine millimeters and decentrate the tree fine so the peripheral edge of the cornea is close to the limbus. Now, the central edge has to be three millimeters from the visual axis, and you want to rotate the opacity under the upper lid. Um, if you look here, I've included a citation of, uh, of a article that you can look at to really go through the surgical steps um, in order to provide this service to your patients. Now, it may not provide good best corrective visual acuity as penetrating keratoplasty because there is a higher amount of postoperative astigmatism. And that's due to inadequate apposition of the central and the peripheral cornea. There's a higher risk of wound leak. And if you combine it with the pupilloplasty, you may be able to really improve the amount of visual stimulus entering the eye. The benefits include re retaining the host endothelium and the stability of the endothelial cell population. There is a reduced need of compliance of postoperative drops, as well as a decreased risk of cataract, glaucoma, infection, and you can remove these sutures much earlier than a penetrating keratoplasty. Now let's move to the last section, which is postoperative considerations. In these patients, what we should be thinking about is very frequent postoperative exams. We need to be seeing these patients at least once a week, if not two to three times a week, to ensure um, that their exams are doing well until early suture removal. Pediatric patients have a stronger inflammatory response due to increased fibrin, so they're at, they are at a higher risk of iris corneal adhesions that can lead to devastating glaucoma. Now, they do have a much quicker healing time between the host and the dorner cornea. This leads to a contraction of corneal tissue and loosening of corneal sutures. Now, these sutures can also form abscesses with corneal neovascularization, which will quickly, within 24 hours, could lead to corneal rejection. So it's really important to get parents involved to be examining their kids daily with a pen light. The parents are the primary caregivers seeing their kids every day and are the ultimate decision makers about what type of surgery as well as when to bring these kids in. So it's very important to give parents red flags of when to return. They also need very frequent uh, steroid drop administrations because there is a high risk of rejection. The parents should be counseled to do daily pen light exams for redness, loose sutures, white spots, or photophobia. The anti-inflammatory regimen I typically like to give my patients IV um, methylprednisone, one milligram per kilogram during the surgery, hourly eye drops, the first few weeks with a very slow taper. You could consider prednisolone acetate, but for any regraft of a PKP in a pediatric patient, I like to do Durazole. 
I also like to add um, restasis or cyclosporin. You could consider tacrolimus, but it's very poorly tolerated due to irritation profile. So I would hesitate to give it to a pediatric patient. And you could consider a short course of oral steroids, especially if you're doing a combination cataract, retina, or glaucoma surgery. Now, these families do need to be counseled on the risk of cataracts and glaucoma due to uh, a ster chronic steroid use in, in their patient's eyes. Looking at long-term considerations and outcomes, kids will have poor cooperations with postoperative exams and care. So going into this, everyone needs to be aware of this and counseled about that. It is very difficult to administer frequent eye drops in kids. Kids can rub their eyes. This can lead to wound dehiscence, loose sutures, and frequent exams under anesthesia are required. Make sure to start and initiate early and aggressive amblyopia treatment with glasses, contact lenses, and patching in combination with your pediatric ophthalmologist. Looking at suture removal, it does require sedation in the OR. Any loose suture or corneal uh, neovascularization requires immediate removal. DSEC sutures can be removed as early as two weeks after surgery, but it is age dependent. So infants, you can start at two to three weeks after a PKP and complete it by six to 12 weeks. One to two year olds, you can do six to eight weeks and so on. Looking at the infection risk, there is a higher risk of graft um, rejection after an early infection, and this can be due to loose sutures, wound dehiscence, persistent epithelial defects, as well as the fact that they are on high-dose steroids. So we do typically tend to recommend topical antibiotics for a longer period of time. This is a patient who came in with a mucopolysaccharidosis-associated penetrating keratoplasty, as you can see here really severe infection. She had a choroidal hemorrhage, uh, choroidals that we had to drain and eventually did end up losing the eye. So this is a very significant risk that we can uh, have associated with uh, corneal transplants. Now the prognosis is guarded. There are lower rates of success in adults. I would say less than 50% of kids end up having really excellent vision. There's a higher rate of graft rejection and failure up to 50 to 80%. And the high risk of vision loss um, is from amblyopia, even with a clear visual axis. Um, now, if you look at repeat corneal transplant, it is a cause, common cause of graft failure, and it can influence the outcome of subsequent grafts. If you're doing a repeat corneal transplant for a scar, you can have graft rejection and infection occur because of that scar. It's better to wait more than six months from the initial rejection episode. And even with a repeat transplant, there's a high risk of complications like immune rejection, epithelial defects, and glaucoma. As you can see here, the graft survival time just decreases significantly as the patients get older and any type of irreversible immune rejection always causes a regraft failure. So there are controversies. Should we be doing immunizations after a graft rejection episode? Some people like to wait two weeks to up to three months. And some people even say no immunizations for up to one year. And that's because the immunizations could potentiate a graft rejection episode. I do recommend increasing topical steroids four weeks before the immunizations. And the best postoperative anti-inflammatory regimen is still unknown. So I'd like to just wrap things up. Let's go back to things that we should consider when doing these transplants. Not every corneal opacity requires corneal transplant surgery. We need to redefine what success is for patients. It's not a clear graft because clear grafts do not always equal clear vision. It is very dependent on the diagnosis as well as the amblyopia treatment. We should, as a community, come together to research and optimize outcomes in order to have the best surgical results for our patients. And I always like to um, provide support groups for my patients in order to allow them to connect to people around the globe that are undergoing some of the same things that they are. So I really want to thank CyberSight for the opportunity to discuss this topic with you. Um, and I do have my contact information here. I'm going to pull up the question and answer and just try to go through as many as we can for the next 10 minutes. And of course, you are welcome to contact me. My uh, information is at the bottom, and I'm happy to connect, collaborate over anything. Um, now, I do see a few questions, which I'm going to go over uh, uh, shortly. Um, Mr. Fard asked, what is the most common corneal graft in children, PKP, DMAC, DSEC, or DALC? I think internationally, as well as in the U.S., PKP is the most common, and that's really because it's the most technically easy to do this type of surgery. We're doing a full thickness trephination. We don't need to um, 
worry about intraoperative OCT, which is typically not uh, even available widely. Um, DSEC and DMEC are very difficult, very challenging for the pediatric population because of the posterior pressure as well as the shallow anterior chambers. And I think in, in my hands, and I'm sure most uh, most surgical practitioners, uh, even internationally, the, the penetrating keratoplasty is most likely the most common corneal surgery that we get. Um, the next question is, what is the minimum age of donor and recipient for corneal graft in children? So the minimum age for the recipient, as I mentioned, for patients that are born with neonatal corneal opacity, so they're born with these congenital opacities, um, there is, there probably are some practitioners that would argue to take these, these kids to the OR earlier. However, I like to follow um, the, uh, the maxim that we do for pediatric cataracts, which have been going on for much longer, which is if it's unilateral, we typically like to clear the visual axis by six weeks of age, if it's bilateral, eight to 10 weeks. So I tend to not want to take these kids to the operating room younger than two months of age. Um, and I think most people around uh, the U.S. at least do the same. And that's really because of the risks of the anesthesia in the first few months, as well as um, the eye and cornea does need to develop some rigidity to suture to. The minimum age of donor tissue is typically around four years of age. So there is a mismatch in the um, donor as well as the recipient. But again, if the endothelial cell count is good, we typically do like to match these uh, in order to get the best possible outcome. Now, if you wanted to do surgery for a younger patient, younger than two months of age, um, I think it'd be very difficult to get tissue at younger than four years of age. I'm not even sure I've seen tissue for younger than four years. Um, and that may be just due to, again, the, uh, the lack of rigidity and the difficulty harvesting and getting this tissue for these patients. Um, when do you remove corneal sutures in children post-PKP or DALC? Um, again, for post-PKP or DALC patients, it depends on the age. Um, I had a slide a few, uh, uh, sorry, I had a slide a few ago, which goes over based off the age. The earliest you can start removing them are two weeks after. Um, post-PKP, uh, I would say the most important thing to remember for PKP and DALC is that we do need to take these patients to the operating room in order to remove their sutures. So like unlike adults where we like to do a uh, topography guided or astigmatism um, minimizing suture removal, when I take these kids to the operating room to remove their sutures, I am removing all of them at once. I've only had one case where the patient did actually dehiss while removing the sutures, um, and I had to just replace the sutures while I was there and bring them back within another few months. Um, but the earliest I would do is two weeks, and then um, as and that's really because the younger patients, their cornea heals so much earlier than older patients. As the kids get into um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and older, you can follow more of an adult regimen. Do you remember, do you um, recommend the scleral fluoringa ring during corneal transplantation? Absolutely. For every patient, I will do a fluoringa ring. Um, I like either the uh, the single fluoringa ring or the double fluoringa ring. I would suture using either Vicryl, Adovicryl, or a nylon suture in all four quadrants to the sclera, um, ensuring that there is no scleral perforation because the sclera is thinner. Um, and you can actually use this to um, hang the corn, the uh, sclera by putting some tension on those sutures and attaching it to the drape. And that can really provide a lot of um, counter-traction as well as support during the surgical removal, as well as prevent collapse, which is very possible in these patients that have very thin scleras. Um, how many times would you consider repeating a corneal graft after failure? Personally, um, I think it really depends on the status of the fellow eye, if the patient is monocular, if this is the only eye that they are using to see, and if they were developing good vision, you could consider repeating corneal transplants multiple times. It also depends on the social support as well as the family support. If the family is very, um, quote unquote, with it, if they are really willing to help, if they're very motivated, if they're able to get the drops in, I would be more likely to do a repeat corneal transplant. Um, I recently had a patient, it's a Down syndrome patient who had 
what I believe initially was a neurotrophic defect with a corneal ulceration. He's had seven transplants um, already, and, and he may be 18 years of age, and now he has developed a desmetaseal in that eye. Now, since his uh, fellow eye has relatively good vision, I think we're going to go with a corneal patch graft instead of a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, because usually once the cornea has been neovascularized to that certain extent, anything more than one or two clock hour uh, quadrants of neovascularization, the risk of rejection goes really high. Um, personally, I probably wouldn't do more than about three to four, but if the family is, is really motivated, I could be convinced to do more. Um, in these patients, I really do like to use Durazol, Restasis, um, or Cyclosporin, um, as well as considering really strict perioperative steroids in order to prevent any future episodes of rejection and, and having them to come back monthly for, for up to a year in order to ensure graft survival and success. Do you remember, uh, do you recommend keratoplasty if the patient has developed sensory nystagmus? Absolutely. Um, typically, if the patient is younger, we are able to get rid of the sensory nystagmus if we're able to rehabilitate the visual axis. Now, if the patient is older, um, for example, if they're eight plus, I think the risk of nystagmus resolution goes down, even if you're able to clear the visual axis. Um, but as I mentioned before, there's there could still be beneficial outcomes in terms of spatiotemporal visual development, um, binocularity, and just really vision that we're not able to quantify based off our typical Snellen charts. So I, I would recommend doing it um, in a sensory nystagmus. Now, again, it also depends on the, on the fellow eye. If the patient has a good second eye, it's, it's possible that you may not want to do that uh, very high risk surgical procedure in a second eye and, and just monitor the sensory nystagmus. The next question is, do you recommend keratoplasty in a tricycle eye? I wouldn't, um, even if it's a, an adult or a child, I would never do a keratoplasty in a tricycle eye. Um, it really depends on what the indications are for wanting this type of surgery. I'm much more likely to do a Gunderson flap, which is a conjunctival flap that covers the visual axis if there is significant ocular surface related pain, a non-healing epithelial defect. If there's an infection, you wanna get the infection controlled first. Um, and usually in tricycle eyes, the cosmesis is, is not great to begin with. So doing a penetrating keratoplasty, which is a high likelihood of failure, um, I'm not very enthused about that. Um, I typically will like to either do a Gunderson flap or refer to an oculoplastics colleague to consider doing things like a nucleation and then placing a prosthetic uh, eye in there with a scleral shell that has a much better cosmetic result than um, doing a penetrating keratoplasty in a tricycle eye, typically because the sclera and the size of the eye is not normal as well. Um, how long do you give topical steroids? I give topical steroids for life. So these patients are getting them hourly for the first few weeks. I give them antibiotic drops until suture removal at four times a day dose. Um, and once the sutures are removed, that's the only time I start to decrease it. And I usually decrease by one drop every three months. And you should see the patient before decreasing any type of steroid. The lowest dose I will ever keep a patient on is one drop a day of prednisolone acetate 1%. Um, there is some consideration for patients that have keratoconus or other corneal ectatic disorders, which are less likely to reject to consider doing Lodamax. Um, but I think that gets into more of an adult type of pediatric, I'm sorry, adult type of corneal transplant, but you could consider doing Lodamax. Um, patients that have uh, ALK procedures are sometimes taken off their steroids. I don't like to in the pediatric population just because it's such a high risk. But if I am dealing with a pediatric, a pediatric patient that has transitioned to adult, we could definitely decrease um, risk of steroid complications by switching them to Lodamax or, or even off drops. When I'm seeing adults in my clinic as well, I feel very anxious to keep them off any type of steroid drop. And that just may be due to my own patient population and demographics here. Um, but even in adults, I like to keep them on steroids. Um, do you prefer for CHED? I would recommend. Um, so the question is for CHED, do you recommend PKP or DMEC? If DMEC, do you remove the host cornea? Um, so for CHED, I think it really depends on the extent of the disease. As we know, there is CHED 1 and CHED 2. It depends on how much corneal clarity there is. If there's enough clarity to be able to score decimase membrane, um, as well as remove the endothelium, I would do a DSEC procedure. If you're able to get a measurement of the anterior chamber depth before as well, that may help. 
Um, and I would do a DSEC procedure. DMEC, I am very <laughs> hesitant to do in kids because of the high rebubble rate. Um, now, if the cornea is very opacified, then I would not be able to see the endothelial tissue being implanted into the anterior chamber, then I would opt for a penetrating keratoplasty. I think we have time for just uh, maybe uh, two more questions. Um, one question is, can we use a smile lenticule and thin corneas or corneal ectasia as an alternative um, for DALK in adults? I, I am not too familiar with using the smile lenticule for corneal ectasia. Um, I know that here in the United States, there are very few practitioners that use SMILE, and it's typically for um, treating different degrees of, of myopia. I haven't really been, uh, been um, familiar with the use of it for corneal ectasia, but it could you know, definitely be something that we could look into. Painful vascularized corneas, how do you manage that? Uh, it's difficult. I think the vascularization isn't typically what causes the pain. It's the corneal rejection as well as failure and then the secondary bullous keratopathy that causes the pain in these patients. Um, in kids, uh, I tend to put them on Muro for any type of uh, corneal edema that does develop. Um, I do switch them from a prednisolone acetate to Durazol, which is a much stronger steroid. And, and Durazol every hour, is an extremely potent steroid. You do want to make sure to monitor their intraocular pressure very closely, but I think that does tend to calm down the inflammation. Um, you could always consider admitting the patients for IV steroids as well. Um, and you could do a short course of oral steroids. Um, I have reversed uh, early immune rejection episodes with oral steroids with a medrol dose pack or solumedrol in younger kids. And um, some of these patients have done very well with that. Um, and last question, if a child is having bilateral corneal opacities involving the visual access, do you go for bilateral optical iridectomy or just in one eye, if not going for a keratoplasty? That's an excellent question. I think it depends on how large the corneal opacities are. If there is, um, you know, the old terminology of, of Peter's anomaly that people like to consider, you could do a bilateral optical iridectomy if the corneal opacity is limited to the central cornea and the peripheral cornea is really clear. It would be really important to determine if there's a better potential eye than the other. And you could consider doing an optical iridectomy in both eyes initially to buy yourself some time to allow the visual stimulus to get into the eye for the vision to develop and do a stage procedure where you do a penetrating keratoplasty later. Um, you could, I, I think I would initially do optical iridectomies in both eyes in order to optimize the vision development so that if you are planning for any type of stage procedure, you are um, more likely to have success with the keratoplasty as opposed to if the vision didn't develop and you do a keratoplasty when the kid is five, six years of age, you're going to have a much lower chance of any visual rehabilitation than if you had initially done um, a bilateral optical iridectomy just to open up the visual access and allow the vision to clear. I think that's about it. And, and we are past our time. So again, I do want to thank CyberSight for this opportunity and thank all of you that have joined from around the world. It's very humbling and, and uh, an honor to be able to discuss this topic with you. Um, please feel free to contact me with any questions, and uh, I look forward to meeting a lot of you in person.